the Princeton Historic Preservation. Okay. This is a special meeting of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission being held electronically via Zoom on June 7th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Pursuant to section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place and agenda of this meeting has been uh, noticed by transmitting a copy to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, The Times, Trentonian, and by filing a copy with the clerk of Princeton, um, which has been posted to the municipal website, www.princetonnj.gov slash meetings. Uh, pursuant to Executive Order 107, due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19, notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission will be held electronically via Zoom. Um, such notices have been placed in the official bulletin board at the municipal complex and on the Princeton website and are to be maintained throughout the year. Um, so the end, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, do you want to do a roll call or should I? Yes, I'll do it. Ms. Capazzoli? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Endersby? Here. Ms. Satterfield? Shirley, you're muted. I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Shore? Mr. Shore? I'll come back. Mr. Shatskin? I'm here. Ms. DeSanzo? Ms. Howard? I'm here. Mr. Pyle? Yo. Elizabeth, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. That Mr. Shore is here. All right, thank, thank you and welcome to the Princeton um, Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Um, we have two applications from Princeton University. Um, the application of trustees of Princeton major site plan with variances, environmental studies and school of engineering and applied science. Um, and we also have the application of um, minor site plan with variances, demolition of three houses to relocate house from 91 Prospect Avenue. Um, so, uh, and that, so anyway, I wanted to um, ask the Princeton University folks, uh, given the fact that I think we have a lot of people who would like to comment on the 91 Prospect Avenue application. Would it be terribly difficult to um, address that first um, in order to accommodate the public interest? Uh, hi, Julie, Christopher DeGrezia. Um, I had mentioned to um, Elizabeth, we actually put together a presentation addressing both at the same time because they were interrelated and there was one report. So, and, and this is a courtesy review. So um, we thought it would, be, um, it would be easier to present it all together at one time. So our presentation goes into both and not one application and then the next application. So um, we'll, we'll have that done, uh, or, you know, as part of the presentation. Okay, well, since um, Elizabeth is having microphone trouble, um, why don't we start with your presentation and then I'll kind of summarize Elizabeth's report and then we can go into discussion. Oh, okay, so you want us to start with our presentation first? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, I think we'll, we'll jump right into the presentation. I'll just say um, one thing so that it's, it's, a, it's clear. Um, this is a courtesy review. Um, both of the applications, as I indicated, ES and Cs, which is the first application listed on your agenda, is basically a project for educational buildings 
It's for state-of-the-art research facilities for the School of Engineering and Applied Science and Environmental Studies, ES and Cs. That's how it's got its name. And the other project is 91 Prospect, which is basically a relocation. When you take a look at um, the properties involved, neither of them are designated as a local historic preservation district or within a buffer district. And there's no specific historic sites that are designated under the local ordinance. Um, so the zoning map doesn't have any districts or buffer districts um, around both of the projects. There is a, a reference in the uh, historic preservation element of the master plan. It's not listed under the area of local historic preservation, preservation districts. Rather, it's in a suggested area to be studied. There's something over 50 areas, I think 38 properties, 10 roads, nine bridges, you know, something like 57 locations that are suggested as areas that should be evaluated. And then once those results are done and, and looked at, then there could be consideration of putting it in the district. But as of now, it's not in the district. And um, there is no requirement for a preservation plan. So um, you, you don't see an application for a preservation plan before the historic review committee this evening. Um, History and preservation, though, is an important part of the university. Um, university is a very strong proponent of um, stewardship and preservation. And that's really the reason why you have two applications this evening. Um, the second application, 91 Prospect, is really an application to save 91 Prospect. It's not in a, a, a location right now that it can be saved. And so in order to preserve the building, um, the application, the second application, and to pro prohibit um, demolition of it is to essentially move it across, move it across the street. Um, like I said, we'll be presenting this as uh, one presentation this evening. And with that, I'd like to start with introduce um, university architect, um, Ron McCoy. Ron, are you gonna start us off or are we gonna start with Meredith? I'm going to start, it off, start us off and then I will bring Meredith in on cue. Okay. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and begin. So let me say that I underst we understand that uh, there's a desire to move quickly through the presentation allowing plenty of time for discussion and public comment. I'll do my best to do that. I'll go fast through some parts, but some projects, parts of the presentation require an explanation of some of the context around the project. And I wanna make sure that we're all clear about some of the foundational information related to the project. And Christopher just reviewed some of that. Um, this is the uh, uh, site plan, overall site plan of both the uh, ESCs uh, and the proposed relocation of 91. Um, 91 Prospect, um, and um, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, project in the context of the university's commitments to overall historic preservation in just a second. You see here highlighted in red the um, boundary of the Princeton uh, Historic uh, District. Um, the, um, it is a state and national district. Uh, there are no individually listed properties uh, in this, in this uh, related to this project. Because of the name of the Princeton Historic District, sometimes people think it's a local district, but it's not. Um, also, it might be helpful to talk about the, um, what's referred to as the Club Road District. The uh, Historic Preservation Officers Report refers to the 1996 Community Master Plan, which was amended in 2012. And there was a suggestion uh, 25 years ago that there should be for a suggestion for consideration of the Club Row District. We've asked a few months ago, the Historic Preservation Officer and the Chair of this committee for copies of the boundary uh, that would describe the Club Row District, uh, which is discussed in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Historic Preservation Officer's letter. We were told that they don't have a record of the area uh, that was suggested for consideration. Um, and although we haven't been able to get a copy of that area suggested for consideration, 
the, the plan 25 years ago refers to the grand homes of the eating clubs. So we take that to be the kind of uh, the houses that are, um, well, not, 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 that would not include the, uh, the three houses, 110, 114, and 116. Um, and the plan, the 1996 master plan does ind indicate some suggested representative sites, but uh, does not include uh, those sites on the north side of the road. So recognizing that the relocation of 91 Prospect is the center focus of conversation for this meeting, uh, we wanted to just to in introduce a couple important uh, topics. Uh, as noted, um, there is a suggestion of this should be considered for Club Road District, and we're you know don't have information on that. So if some, anyone here on the in the in the committee has information, that would be helpful. And to reiterate what Christopher said at the beginning, they are not in any historic district, neither state, national, or or local. When the Princeton Historic District was modified in 2017, there was an opportunity to add these these houses to the district and that opportunity was not taken. 62 Washington Road was added to the district, but these houses were not added to the district. So they remain outside of the district. Um, the, um, uh, I'm gonna ask Emily if she can go to her screen. Emily Kirkland, can, you, can we switch to your screen? I'm gonna stop sharing. I've, had, I've got some troubles and it's gonna be painful if I have to work through this. So Emily, can we uh, look at your presentation? Great. Okay, so if you can go forward. Okay, let's pause here. Oh, nope, go back one. Okay. So, um, the uh, letter we received today also asked for some explanation of the campus plan context. Um, this is the 2026 campus plan published about three and a half years ago. And we were careful in the campus plan to indicate where growth could happen. It wasn't a promise that growth will happen there uh, ever or over a particular period of time, but we are we were purposeful in identifying opportunity sites for both near-term and long-term development. So this is all of the university land. On the next slide, Emily. We can now zoom into the area that's related to this particular project. Uh, so this is a detail from the 2026 campus plan. As you can see, we anticipated using the site of 91 Prospect for part of the ESNC's project. You can also see the suggestion of a, of a gateway. But importantly, you can see that there are no other neighborhood sites were, that were identified for university development as envisioned by the 2026 campus plan. This is important to note because I know that one of the concerns that was in the presentation uh, from Clifford Zink and PPF, it cites a very disturbing precedent for future moves or demolition. I think the record would show that there's very little precedent. There's mostly a precedent for restoration and stewardship. And this is, this is a, an opportunity that we have um, identified in the campus plan. It's interesting, I went back to the 1996 campus plan, I'm sorry, the 1966 campus plan, and it also identifies this site for university development. And the point is that for more than 50 years, the university has recognized the benefit of enhancing a connection between the campus north of Prospect and the campus south of Prospect. And that's one of the goals, it's the campus connectivity that we are uh, seeking to achieve with this project. Next. So as I've said a couple of times, university supports the goal of historic preservation, and we have a record of being exceptionally strong stewards of, of our buildings. In just the past 20 years alone, we've preserved, we have preserved, rehabilitated um, more than 80 historic buildings and landscapes. Um, historic preservation as a, as a general principle has never been about freezing the past in time. It has always been about managing change. And that's one of the roles of this committee and of the, of the ordinance. Successful cities evolve through a combination of both preservation and historic development. So historic preservation is fundamentally about managing this evolution and this change. I wanna just say it's not an either or proposition. Change and preservation are constantly balanced in the evolution of cities, towns, and campuses. This project needs to be seen in the context of our overall record of stewardship uh, 
you see on this image, um, the you know a handful of those 80, 80 plus projects on campus and in the neighborhood. And we absolutely prefer to rehabilitate historic buildings whenever we have a chance. And that generally means when there's a reasonably good fit between the building and the function. It is not possible to achieve, to rehabilitate an existing building when, the, when there is an uh, unviable fit between the programmatic need and the, existing and the existing fabric of the building. And that's what we're gonna talk about here today. Next, next slide, Emily. Um, this is uh, just looking at Prospect Avenue and the, and the buildings that we have uh, stewarded over time. You see uh, Benheim House, Campus Club, Carl Field, the former Elm Club, Lopes Hall. All of those have um, a, a programmatic fit between what we wanted to put in the building and the, the, the kind of um, spaces that were accommodated in those particular buildings. Can we go to the next one? This slide talks about, uh, these are all within the Princeton Historic District. And uh, this is just simply to say that we also have accommodate, a history of accommodating co contemporary buildings within the historic context of the campus. Uh, so all these are contemporary buildings that respect the fabric scale and pattern making of campus in the historic district uh, of the university. Next slide, Emily. I also wanna say that any at architects, um, one of the qualifications that we selected in them for this project is their expertise in designing contemporary buildings in historic settings and also in their expertise in adaptive reuse. Next. So we'll return to this uh, image a couple times during the presentation, but the point here to be made is that this is the proposed new theorist pavilion, which is the piece that comes up and replaces 91 Prospect. And um, as I would say that um, it is very consistent with that previous slide of all the contemporary buildings in the historic district that Princeton has designed. And this building in particular, by all of its, its location, its setback, its volume, its height, its width, its mass is compatible with the, with the buildings on, on the street. Next. All right, now we're gonna go this part, I think we can go a little bit more quickly through the context and planning principles of, of the project, just to give you some, some better background. Uh, this one is just the overall boundary of the site. We can go next. Uh, here we're showing uh, these yellow circles, which talk about some social activity nodes. Uh, you can see one is gonna be planned for the ESNC's neighborhood. And importantly, you can see the diagonal pathway that connects from Prospect Avenue through the site for ADA access and how that connects to the overall network of pathways that go uh, westward across the, across the campus. Next. This just simply diagrams the programmatic adjacencies. Uh, you can see how that connectivity between the campus south of Prospect and the campus north of Prospect is very important. Uh, Environmental Studies has a handful of relatively new buildings. I mean, I'm sorry, School of Engineering and Applied Science has a handful of relatively new buildings on the north side of Prospect. We're not abandoning that campus. And connectivity uh, among students and faculty from the north side to the south side is an important aspect of the gateway. Next. Uh, this again, talks about how the uh, campus making of the ESNC site is interconnected with the traditions of landscape and pathways and courtyards that characterize the sense of place of the Princeton campus. Next. And then this just highlights, again, the multiple gateways to the project. Uh, the one um, on the side of 901 Prospect is the easternmost gateway into the, into the project and also into the campus. Roper Lane's another one, and at the western end uh, on access with Fisher Bendheim, there's another one. And then along Ivy Lane and Western Way, there are a handful of moments of uh, gateway moments into the overall organization of the site. Next. All right, so let's take a little bit of time here to talk about um, some of the challenges of the existing 901 prospect. Uh, this shows the relationship of the theorist pavilion to the uh, CBE building, which is off on the right. Uh, most importantly, it's you see these green loops and arrows on the on the drawing. This this talks about the the need for experimentalists and theorists to collaborate and work together. Um, uh, individuals will be um, in the theorist pavilion, going back and forth to the laboratories in the CBE building, and so we have to create a state of the art facility that allows that kind of uh, proximity and combination, and and connect connectivity. Next. 
this shows the existing 901 prospect and the uh, really the challenge and the disconnect of being able to relate the floor levels of the new CBE building to the floor levels of uh, the existing 91 prospect. These floor levels differ by you know, six to nine feet, which would, require, eight, which would require a complicated system of ramps, stairways, elevators uh, to get back and forth between the, build, the two buildings and really would not accommodate the kind of connectivity that, that we need. Next. This then compares the plan configuration of the two, two buildings, 91 prospect at the top and the theorist pavilion at the bottom. And the, the message here is that the family of spaces that are in the 91 Prospect Building work incredibly well for the Dean of Research Offices, which are currently the occupants of that. And so as Christopher said, the opportunity to save the building with, the, with a compatible use is what we're trying to achieve here. The Dean for Research fits 91 Prospect just the way the Cannon Club uh, functions fit the original building, the way Carl Fields fits the original building, the way Bob's Hall fits the original building. But, the, but the, the, space, the family spaces that we need for this project uh, in order to recruit and retrain, retain the world-class faculty and students do not fit the family spaces that we need. And if we were to do, if we were to do it, uh, we would need to gut the interior to achieve the kinds of spaces um, that we uh, need for this program. And then we just have a kind of shell of a building with a facade. Next. Um, so this is a summary of those points that, uh, that 91 Prospect is literally too small. Um, it doesn't have the right floor to floor heights. It's not accessible. It, has, it has, uh, does not have the right amount of daylight. The configuration, it doesn't meet the family of spaces that we need. Uh, and, it's, and it's well suited for the Dean for Research. Next. Um, this is then a slide that talks about the character inside of 91 Prospect. And as I said, if we were to try to renovate the building so that we have the family of spaces that we need for, for this particular project, then we would have to gut really the building to do that. By, by relocating it on the other side of the street, we can retain all of the uh, existing fabric of the, of the building. Next. And then um, this then puts the building in context of the, of the uh, street. We are working with the uh, Prospect, Princeton Prospect Foundation to rehabilitate all the street trees. Um, we have some challenges with the uh, utility wires on the north side of the street, um, east of Olden. We're still working on that. But if you see the bottom right hand image here of, of uh, the, the beautiful quality of the street with the street trees, that's what we're sort of aiming to achieve. And I think in a way, that is, is the most dominant uh, characteristic of the experience of, the, of Prospect as a street. And that's what this project will, will enable. So this is not, this, this uh, um, uh, renovation of Prospect Avenue is a separate project that we're working on. It's really not part of, the, uh, of this particular project, but obviously it intersects this particular project. Next. And then um, to, to address just the overall uh, context of the Stearist Pavilion, which you see in the upper left here, number two, this diagram shows how uh, the building in its, as I mentioned earlier, in its height, in its width, in its massing, uh, is very compatible with the pattern of buildings um, in, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, and its setback, which is shown on the, on the lower part of this drawing, is also consistent with the pattern of buildings in, in this neighborhood. Next. And then um, to talk a little bit about the architectural fabric, uh, the building is, um, uh, picks up the uh, proportions of the framed windows, which are characteristic of the collegiate Gothic window systems. You know, the houses on the street are eclectic, they're different styles, but there is a dominant uh, trend toward the collegiate Gothic, which has limestone window surrounds. And this, the windows of this building, very simple classic pavilion uh, in, in the language of classical architecture a contemporary version of that language, and then the proportions pick up the pattern of windows um, on uh, Prospect Avenue. The material, these, these, these uh, uh, verticals and horizontals you see, you see would be aluminum, but they are painted uh, and finished with a texture that would uh, replicate the um, uh, limestone, which is, which is typical of the street. Next. And then we wanted to show just the, the um, um, setback of the building from, from the street to show how it fits into the kind of pattern of buildings in the neighborhood. On the upper right, you'll see the Theorist Pavilion, 
with the uh, chemical and biological engineering building sitting behind it. And you see that uh, that red dashed line shows the kind of uh, vista from a, a street view to the parapet of the CBE building. Uh, compared to the other buildings on this page, through Fisher Benheim, through the North Garage, the Prospect Apartments, or frankly through some of the clubs, uh, this the, the massing of this building on the street is uh, is uh, on the low side of of those kinds of comparable massings. Next, all right. I'm going to explain this drawing briefly, and then we'll talk about it. So. Up on the upper part, you're seeing a small scale section all the way through the north elevation of uh, looking north of Prospect Avenue. So you'll see the McKinley white wall in the middle, the kind of colored piece of the wall, there we are. And then you'll see the site uh, highlighted with that red bracket on the, on the right. Below here, you see the uh, uh, same image uh, zoomed in that shows the parking garage on the left, the relocated 91 prospect in the middle and the um, uh, 91 and the, and the apartments on the right. And I pre we present this just to say that uh, there was a comment that uh, the building was sandwiched in between the existing buildings. I think you can see that there's a very generous proportion between this building and the adjacent building. It's, it's more than two to one, which is uh, 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 pretty generous and bracketed by mature trees to the east and to the west of the existing uh, building. Next. So um, the, this is a view of uh, along the street looking to the south. Um, and we're looking at the space between two of the existing clubs. We're looking at the uh, environmental studies building in the distance. You can see the yellow line, which is drawn across the, the drawing. Uh, this shows the perspective and the height that you'd, you'd see of that building in the distance. So you can see it more or less lines up with the second floor level of the, of the clubs. Uh, this was another request to show the context of the, of, of the new buildings in the context of the street. So this shows how it sits there. Next slide. Shows how the existing condition is now with the vista toward um, uh, the stadium. Next. And then um, this is also trying to address the request to give more understanding of the context. The upper drawing is shows Prospect Avenue on the left, Ivy Lane on the right. Um, and so we're looking at a section to look into the east. And you can see how the building tucks into the sloping hillside with four stories in a penthouse toward Ivy Lane and then three stories in a penthouse uh, facing to the north toward the clubs. The bottom drawing shows a section through um, looking to the north with Fitzrandolph over on the right-hand side of the drawing. The residence is on Fitzrandolph there in the foreground, and then the CBE building in the distance. Next. This then shows if you are on Fitzrandolph looking to the west, the yellow line again is the profile, the silhouette of the, of the CBE building against the sky. And again, from here, you actually wouldn't even see the building and it would be below the rooftop of the buildings on Fitzrandolph, next. All right, we'll talk briefly about building character and design. This is just to kind of give you a flavor of the design. So let's go through this part quickly next. Um, needless to say, we have a lot of sustainable, sustainability principles built into the project. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them here, but we can get to that uh, if, you, if there are questions about it next. This is again about um, the, uh, how the building responds to our sustainability action plan, which is a university-wide set of initiatives, next. Uh, one of the uh, architectural elements of the plan of the buildings is to um, maximize the use of mass timber, which uh, will in, reduce the embodied carbon of the project. And this diagram shows all those areas that are in a kind of yellow or orangish color are areas of mass timber construction. Next. This is the overall uh, bird's eye rendering. So you see the building is intentionally sort of sinuous. Uh, it sort of inflects and gestures to break down the scale and mass of the building. It's, it's, it is 660,000 square feet, so it's quite large, but we wanted to um, uh, break down that scale so that it has a, has a kind of campus uh, fit to the neighborhood next. And then just going around the building, uh, we like to say that the, the building has no fronts, has all fronts, no backs. So if you're looking at the north side of the building, this is an entrance into one of the atria. Next. Uh, if you're on uh, Ivy Lane looking to the east, um, Peyton would be just off to the right. And this shows the forecourt 
into uh, the environmental studies part of the project on the left next. This is a uh, view toward the middle of the site. On the right uh, is the commons, which is a library space and a social space that serves the entire campus. And on the left, you see a set of stairs that climb up to the um, C's, one of the C's buildings, the Bio E building next. If we are on um, Prospect and we're on Roper Lane, you'll see we are rebuilding Roper Lane, as I said, to make it ADA compliant. And um, this is a view toward the, uh, the north side of the environmental uh, studies building. You'll see a kind of another atrium peeking off onto the right next. This is the view in that atrium. So it'll be a welcoming and inviting building uh, on all sides next. And then we're, we're starting to move a little bit to the east. Uh, this is a, a gap between the environmental studies building on the right, the bioengineering building on the left, looking at the commons, the stadium would be beyond next. And then we're turning around now to the, uh, to the east. We see in the foreground on the right, the uh, north face of the bioengineering building. We're looking at the chemical and biological engineering building and the bridge that connects the two. And then we're looking over to the, um, a theorist pavilion, which is just peaking in the understories of the of the landscape on the west and on the on the street next. Uh, here we are back at the theorist pavilion, looking at the at the front of the pavilion. I would say that the the uh, landscape here is intentionally supposed to be open, welcoming, and public, and so uh, and contemporary. And so the simple grove of trees reflects the kind of classical modern design of the building creates a, a kind of uh, gravelly plaza that people can cr crisscross uh, in pathways if they're coming in on access here to the front entrance, or if they're coming in uh, to, the, to the campus gateway, which is a little bit off to the right-hand side of, of this drawing. Next. Um, then uh, as you are on that access into the campus, you see the, uh, the theorist building on the on clipping the left-hand side of this image. You see the gateway through the CBE building going uh, straight ahead. Also, I have a correction to make. Uh, one of our architects corrected me. I, I misspoke about the material of the of this, uh, theorist building. It's a uh, material that's a glass fiber reinforced, um, glass reinforced fiber uh, that is, um, a, it's a kind of panelized system. Next. And then here we are coming through the um, uh, gateway into the site. There's a large open green lawn. Uh, for the engineering side of the complex, we're looking at uh, the uh, uh, BioE building on the left, the CBE, CBE building on the right. And it's important to note that we're also above the loading dock. So there's a completely submerged loading dock that provides all the service and access to the project. And that's underneath this green, this green plaza. Next. And then if you go to the what we call the North-South Connector, which goes up the, uh, uh, the eastern side of the project, here's the entrance into that loading dock that you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. Next. And then back onto um, uh, Western Way and, and Ivy Lane, looking a little bit toward the north and to the, to the west, you see the Commons building again. Next. Quickly through the site planning and landscape design, let's go next. Um, I wanna talk about some of the community connections. This is a part of the campus, but it's also um, provides pathways, walkways, um, and connectivity for the, for the local community through that, throughout the site. You'll see here on the left, um, or in the center of the diagram, the Roper Lane is, is dotted. Uh, Roper Lane goes, well now gets diverted and becomes Leafy Lane. That's the placeholder name that we've given it. That will become a pedestrian and bicycle pathway through the site and also does provide vehicular access for service vehicles and for access to uh, the back of some of the clubs. Uh, you'll see the North-South Connector off on the right. That is a bypass street that keeps traffic off of the local neighborhood streets and provides access into the loading dock. Next. This talks about some of the gateways, as I've mentioned, um, the connectivity of this, part of, the, of this part of the campus, both to the uh, west, to the existing campus, and to the north, to Prospect and beyond, is a key feature. And so you see these heavily uh, uh, emphasized blue lines that are the places of connectivity. And, and you'll see that uh, one of them goes through the, the site of 91 Prospect and the other one through Roper. Next. In terms of ADA compliance, we've realized from the beginning and from the campus plan drawing that I showed you that getting accessible pathways through the site is, is very important. 
this is a kind of complicated drawing, but you'll see the every time you see a red circle with that diagonal line through it, that's a stairway, which is not accessible. But there's always uh, an accessible route that's, a, that's either adjacent to that, or one can go into a lobby, take an elevator down, and get connect from the upper part of the site to the lower part of the site. So the site is, is designed in a fully ADA compliant way so that we can have a, a lot of easy connections and accessible connections through the campus. Next. And then um, uh, the landscape has a variety of, of uh, special places for gathering, for lingering, for social space, for community, for activities surrounding the site. And again, these become community assets just the way the rest of the campus becomes a community resource for walks and enjoying the quality of landscapes that we do. Next. Um, I'm just gonna go through three slides here showing the vocabulary of native. Uh, this shows the mixed uh, uh, native planting of trees. Next. Some of the understory, native understory. Next. Uh, some of the native uh, ground cover. Next. And, and some of the uh, rain garden plants. Next. Okay, um, I think that um, we want to um, leave, I'm gonna transition now to the, the, the 91 prospect um, specifics of that project. I would like to say that just closing this part of the, of the presentation that um, the university has enormous respect for the principles and values of historic preservation. We recognize that um, our first choice is to try to restore and reuse and re rehabilitate existing buildings, but not every building can be preserved. As Christopher said at the beginning here, this is a plan to preserve um, 91 Prospect by moving it across the street. Um, and we realize that choices have to be made, and this is one of the choices that we have to do, that we have to make for this particular project. In the context of three houses on the north side, 110, 114, or 116, just to reiterate, they're not in the local district, they're not in the state or national district. They've been consistently omitted from the Princeton Historic District. Um, and uh, this is an opportunity to prioritize and save uh, 91 uh, prospect. Uh, so let's move on from here. And we'll go to 91 Prospect. So just re, re coming, coming back to this image, which talks about the relocation of 91 uh, Prospect across the street. I'm gonna ask uh, Meredith Bizdak, our historic preservation consultant to jump in here and to do two things. If you can help frame this part of the conversation and also uh, pick up any mistakes or misstatements that I might have made along the way, that would be really helpful. Uh, thanks, Ron. I think you did just fine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Meredith Bizdak. I am an architectural historian and a partner with Mills and Schnoring Architects. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our preservation, preservation strategy and provide a little more information on 91 Prospect, as well as 110, 114, and 116 Prospect. And just to let you know uh, sort of the, the methods that we used and how this conversation evolved. Um, as part of our due diligence, we work with the university to do evaluation on all of the buildings uh, that, that are um, interrupted by uh, the planning that goes on. Um, so our evaluation involves a combination of research, field work, and evaluation discussions. And there are many discussions that do take place about these things. They're, they're always very seriously considered. As Ron said, one of the first things we look at is the current preservation status for buildings. In this case, as you've heard before, none are considered individual local landmarks. None are included in a designated local district. None are individually designated on a state or national level, and there have been no determinations of eligibility. 91 Prospect is included in the state and national register listed historic district, otherwise known as the Princeton Historic District. 110, 114, and 116 prospect are not included within that district, either originally or in the 2017 expansion of the district that focused on the eating clubs. And none of the four buildings are specifically referenced in the proposed club row local district that's identified in the master plan. So some background first on 91 prospect. It was constructed in 1927 as court club and designed by an architect named Grosvenor Wright. It was expanded in 1955-1956 by a Princeton-trained architect named Raymond Olson, and Olson basically expanded the building according to the original designs by Grosvenor Wright with some limited changes. 
It ceased operations as an eating club in 1964, and it was purchased by the university at that point in time and repurposed as part of Stevenson Hall in 1968. It was converted to offices for the university's use in 2001, and it continues in that capacity today. With respect to 110, 114, and 116 Prospect, I think you're all aware that all three buildings were moved to their present site on the north side of Prospect in the 1920s as eating clubs began to displace smaller frame buildings. And uh, part of the story of the street actually is the story of change and evolution and the way in which the larger uh, masonry clubs, the more elaborate clubs began to displace some of the, the smaller frame structures, the smaller residences that had previously been erected. 110 was purchased from a private resident by Key and Seal Club in 1904 and expanded by 1907. It had two more additions by 1918. In the mid 1920s, it became Arbor Inn and Arbor is the one that moved it across Prospect to the north side of the street. It was purchased by the university in 1928, renovated and divided into multiple units. In one, uh, with respect to 114 Prospect, that too was built as a private residence, moved in the 1920s, and some of its original Queen Anne detail remains. Uh, the building at the present time is vacant. 116, also built as a private residence, moved in the 1920s, Features some Queen Anne style, but modified extensively, has an enclosed porch, an expansion to the rear, and was reconfigured rather extensively on the interior for use as faculty offices and has little original detail remaining on its interior. So we looked at all four buildings with respect to the National Register criteria for eligibility and those four criteria, the association with events that have made significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, association with lives of significant persons, buildings that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type period or method of construction, or that represent the work of a master or possess high artistic values. And lastly, have yielded or may yield information important in history or prehistory. In other words, uh, properties that are archeologically significant. To be eligible, properties must also re retain integrity and to a degree that they are able to convey their significance. The National Register recognizes seven aspects of integrity. Those would be location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. In a summary, 110, 114, and 116 are relatively typical examples of late 19th century dwellings, lacking in individual distinction and with varying degrees of retaining integrity. No information as to their association with significant events or individuals has been located. 110 to 114 and 116 prospect were all moved to the site in, 19, in the 1920s, as I mentioned. Location uh, is similar, but has been somewhat compromised and changed. 110 and 116 prospect have lost integrity of design, materials, and workmanship. And in summary, we do not believe that these buildings are eligible for a listing on the National Register of Historic Places individually. 91 Prospect, however, has a higher degree of integrity and has already achieved a level of distinction by its inclusion in the state and national register listed Princeton Historic District. So when we were weighing all of the uh, options for the buildings in question, it emerged that 91 Prospect was worthy of preservation and saving and hence its relocation to the north side of Prospect. Ron, I'll turn that back to you. Actually, Meredith, if we, let me, let's go to the next two slides and have you, if there's anything you wanna add as we look at those next two slides. This is a current photograph of 91 Prospect. Uh, the original portions of the building are the center wing and the wing on the right side of this photo. The left wing is the one that was added in the 1950s, um, but that brought the building to its full configuration as originally intended. Uh, and in the work that uh, is intended to, to uh, occur, once the building is moved, there'll be a, um, a, a restoration essentially of what exists as of the building envelope and on the interior, uh, it will be placed on a new foundation. The roof will be replaced with some new slate. Um, Ron may have some more details. Yep. 
but it will essentially be exactly what you see here today. And there will be an attempt to place it in a context that is very similar to the one it exists within today. Let's go to the next one, Emily. And a couple of historic photographs. So the one on the left was a photograph taken shortly after the building was completed um, and shows you that original center wing and right bay. Um, and you'll notice that the entrance was originally at the center. But when the wing was added in the 1950s, that became the main entrance and that center entrance was converted to windows. And that's the that corresponds to the great hall that you see in the upper left here, um, the main hall, which is really one of the most significant character defining is within the building and one that we definitely want to preserve. Um, and uh, the photograph on the lower right shows that wing being added in the 1950s under construction. Okay, great. Thank you. That's very helpful. I'll pick it up from here. So Emily, let's look at the next one. Just a, a reminder of the, of the site. Next. So this shows just the logistics of relocating the building. Um, the uh, the way it's done is by putting a, a grid of steel beams under, under the building, lifting it up, putting the grid of, of beams underneath it, uh, rotating it uh, so that it has the front door toward the street as it moves across the street and re is relocated on the, the northern side of the street. You'll see the buffer of trees to the existing trees on the west and on the east of, of the proposed location. Next. Um, this is just a site plan that shows that uh, building in its, in its proposed location. The red dashed line that goes around the, the, the building is really a part of the, the, the logistics plan. That's the, those are the clearances that are required to um, move the building and to um, remove the steel grid uh, from underneath uh, the building. Next. Uh, this is just uh, for information, the distances between the um, building and its adjacent buildings. As we've said, there's some concern that it was compressed in that location. It's actually uh, quite, quite roomy and has a kind of park-like setting with the uh, mature existing trees. And you'll see a, a handful of proposed new trees that I think complement that existing landscape. You'll also know that there's a 250-foot um, uh, residential zone buffer. So there is a variance attached to this project for a residential uh, to allow this uh, educational occupancy in this residential neighborhood. But uh, I think Sprab was very favorable for that and thought that this was uh, um, improved the setback because the existing house, existing university buildings are closer to that buffer. Next. Uh, as Meredith said, the uh, project will involve uh, extensive rehabilitation of the building. So you see this diagram, obviously the upper part is the part that's rehabilitated with the new roof, brick repointing, uh, flashing gutters, downspouts, and repair of the cast stone window surrounds. Um, the, the green box, the lower part, the foundation um, at, is all new, and then it'll have a mechanical system upgrade as well. Next. Uh, this is a detailed landscape plan that shows the, uh, the trees uh, re removed and the trees remaining. Uh, we don't have to go into this detail unless there are questions next. And then these are the 26 new trees that, as, as, as I said, uh, complement, infill, and uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of enhance that uh, park-like setting of the building in the site. Next. And then some more details of the uh, stormwater management strategy. I don't know if we have to get into that detail in this conversation, but uh, there are ground, ground cover types that, that have to do with, uh, the, that serve the rain gardens and uh, some of the existing lawn, which is in keeping with the neighborhood. Next. There are uh, improvements to ADA pathways. Uh, so we retain the historic axial entrance from Prospect uh, and then we add an ADA pathway that comes up to the porch uh, from, from Prospect. And then we also will add an ADA pathway in brick connecting to an ADA parking on the north side of the building. Next. And then this just uh, talks about uh, stormwater management strategies. Um, it's, uh, there's a reduction in impervious cover uh, through this project. And uh, nevertheless, there's the addition of these rain gardens, which will restore the water on site in addition to the creation of an infiltration trench that you see in the lower left. Next. Okay, I think that's it. 
one more. All right, so I think we can pause here. This is uh, just an overall site plan that we can use for the basis of conversation whenever you uh, have uh, want to want to get to that part of the of the meeting. Okay, um, I'm just going through um, some questions. Uh, two things I want to um, clarify, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to clarify for the public that um, the hearing today is uh, we are being advisory to the planning board. Um, so an overall decision on this application has not been made. Uh, and so our job today is to basically come up with a memorandum um, that will advise the planning board on our, um, our views and suggestions. Um, that said, um, I did wanna go over a couple things in the report, just because Elizabeth spent a long time working on it. And um, I think a lot of the material was covered in the presentation, but there was one point that um, I don't think was addressed and that had to do with um, that relocating a building could affect its um, its eligibility for um, uh, preservation. So um, uh, let's see. Um, it just basically says um, that the the area is historic as well as the building. And so that may be a concern of, um, of people watching the presentation. Um, I know that um, there's definitely uh, questions on the commission side, but given that there's so many people um, wanting to put into public comment, I thought we could move to public comment um i guess we could could we go back to the regular screen um thank you and then um we could go to public comment and then go back to the commission for a follow-up but um elizabeth and justin um i think you guys are in charge of bringing in um uh the people with their hand raised um from the public so elizabeth and justin madam chair you can you hear there? me yes can you hear me yes okay um yes. i brought i brought uh clifford zink in i believe that you felt that he was uh probably the the first person that should go because and Julie, if I can, I can just um, interrupt for a second before Clifford speaks. Uh, there's been a lot of activity in the Q&A and in the chat. And I just want you to make sure that the public knows that those comments will not be part of the record of the meeting. So if people have questions or comments, they really need to raise their hand and participate in the meeting. All right, thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I think um, Clifford, you're brought Sandy in. And Cliff oh. Sorry. Do you want? Let me see if Sandy, I can bring Sandy. Okay. I think Sandy and Clifford are presenting together. Okay. They're bro both brought over as panelists. Okay, thank you. All right, hello. Clifford and Sandy, if you could unmute yourself and put on your video. Done. Okay, so we're trying to keep it brief. There are, um, I think 60 people waiting to comment. So I guess if you wanna start and then we'll go from there. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Sandy Harrison. I am the, I hope you can, see, you can see me. Okay, I'm an alumnus of the uh, university and I'm the board chair of Princeton Prospect Foundation. Uh, a major role of this charitable foundation is to educate the public about the historical and architectural significance of Princeton's <laughs> iconic eating clubs, including the landscape along Prospect Avenue and to uh, support their preservation. To this end, uh, Princeton Prospect Foundation is profoundly concerned about the proposed moving of the former court clubhouse across Prospect Avenue and out of the Princeton Historic District and demolishing three historic homes and houses, including a former eating club to make room for it. In our view, such a move would substantially diminish the aesthetic and historic continuity of Prospect Avenue and it would set a disturbing precedent for the future moving and or demolition of other historic eating clubhouses. Moreover, in our opinion, the university can achieve its functional objectives for a new engineering and science building complex without uprooting this portion of Prospect Avenue because there is adjacent mm -hmm. university owned land that can be used instead for what amounts to be a fairly small physical portion of this project. Princeton Prospects Foundations, our concerns are supported by the alumni leadership of the 11 active eating clubs. In addition, over the past week and a half, during which the public first became aware of the university's proposal to significantly disrupt the area of Prospect Avenue in question, there's been enormous concern expressed among town residents and others, as evidenced by at latest count 618 and counting signatures of a town resident um, generated online petition um, in opposition to the pros pose moving of the court clubhouse. Lead stories on this issue also have been published in Planet Princeton and Town Topics, along with ed letters to the editor and other comments from concerned citizens. Um, getting close to being done my spiel here. In 2017, Princeton Prospect Foundation engaged Clifford Zink who is a historic preservation consultant, author, and longtime town resident to document the history of the eating clubs for the National Register of Historic Places and to prepare a groundbreaking book on them with a special emphasis on their distinguished architecture and on the architects who designed them. This book also has spawned numerous talks as well as public tours and open houses of the eating clubs. I, along with Clifford and Carl Pettit, who is an alumnus, architect, and a native of Princeton, have worked since early last fall in an attempt to convince the university to develop a plan that will not denigrate the Princeton Historic District and Prospect Avenue. After Clifford and Carl speak next, I'm, we know there are many town residents who would also like to express their own views on this vital issue. So thank you, Historic Preservation Committee and staff for your thoughtful consideration of this very important historic preservation matter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, now I think we're going to Clifford. Uh, thank you, Julie. Can I share my screen? I think, yes. yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. How about, how about that? Can you see? Everybody see that? Yes, yes. Okay, so let's start with the historic district. It was, as mentioned, uh, established in 1975, a very large district. In that time, the details were uh, not very extensive. So uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the submission that we made in uh, 2017, 138 pages of uh, extensive details and photographic documentation of the evolution of the clubs. Uh, Ron and others seem to imply that the three houses were not worthy of inclusion and that's why we didn't include them in the expanded district, but that is not the case. Uh, this district was meant to uh, this additional documentation was meant to specifically address the major clubhouses that operated as eating clubs for a very long period of time. And uh, the uh, building at 110, which was an eating club, quickly uh, 
went out of use. And so we included photographs of it, but it was not a feature of the, of the documentation or the book. Let's see if I can switch. So uh, this shows, and we already saw a slide of the Princeton Historic District. You can see the boundary where Court Club House is. This is just in case uh, anybody has trouble understanding the district. It's only on the historic, the National Register District is only on the south side of Prospect. Uh, now, I hope you can read all this, but um, this is about National Park Service guidelines for a Stark District, two different documents. The, the significance of properties is embodied in, in their sites and settings, as well as in the buildings. Properties in the National Register should be moved only when there's no feasible alternative and with evidence that the proposed site does not possess historical significance that would be adversely affected by the intrusion of the structure. That's not what exists in this case. Uh, I mean, there is historical significance where the university is proposing to move 91. Uh, if a structure holds a prominent position in the middle of an historic district or a street that presents a unified appearance, its removal might leave an awkward gap or destroy the rhythmic harmony of the street or neighborhood. And that is certainly what is being proposed here. Moving an historic building destroys some of its historic fabric and lessens its integrity because it's coming off its original site. Moving of historic dis, uh, structures can create a false sense of historical development, which will happen when 91 is on the other side of prospect. Uh, it won't be um, sandwiched between the parking garage and the apartment building, but it will be isolated there, isolated from the 10 other clubs on the north side of the street, uh, excuse me, the south side of the street. When a property is moved, every effort should be made to reestablish its historic orientation, setting, and general environment. That, of course, is not proposed here because it cannot happen. But what will happen is Court Club will be deleted from the National Register, as will the lot where, uh, where Court Club now exists. So National Park Service guidelines for new construction within the boundaries of historic properties. New construction needs to be built in a manner that protects the integrity of the historic buildings and the property setting. I know it's a, a bit laborious to listen to me reading these, but this language is directly from the National Park Service and it is being uh, ignored in this application. New construction should be placed away from or at the side or rear of the stark buildings and it must not obscure, damage or destroy character defining features of the building or the site New construction, including landscaping, must not alter the historic character of a property. In properties with multiple historic buildings, the historic relationship between buildings must also be protected. Contributing historic buildings within a historic district must not be isolated from one another by the insertion of new construction, which is exactly what is being proposed here. So here we are, an aerial of the site, which you've seen before. And uh, you can see um, Ron talked about connectivity and all of us in town uh, are really in favor of the university uh, succeeding as well as possible. Ron talked about connectivity. Uh, you can see there's space between court clubhouse and the building to its left, which is the former Key and Seal Cl Court Club. Uh, former Key and Seal Clubhouse. There's 37 or 39 feet in between those two buildings. It could certainly have a pedestrian pathway in there. And then there's university vacant land to the east of Court Clubhouse where it could, it wants to have a, uh, a driveway to get to the main buildings. There's plenty of room for a driveway plus uh, more connectivity including potentially a smaller pavilion, which if designed 
to fit into the historic district would be perfectly accessible. If the university had said to its architects, we want to have connectivity onto Prospect Avenue, but we're going to respect the historic district and the and Court Clubhouse and the three historic houses across the street. ENEAD, the architects at ENEAD would have said fine and they would have come up with a plan to accommodate that. So here's what the university's proposing. You can see how the bosque of trees does not fit into the historic district. Um, on the right hand side, my view of where it says section of Princeton historic district that will be orphaned is obscured by uh, small screens of various participants. But this is going to do exactly what the park service uh, says is inappropriate, which is to orphan buildings in an historic district. This proposal does not blend in with the university's uh, objective for this project to blend seamlessly into the current campus fabric. Instead, it will demolish houses that are part of campus history and it will split and damage the district with incompatible buildings and landscaping. All of this is contrary to National Park Service policy for historic buildings and historic districts. So here's what the university is proposing. Uh, this is an earlier view of the court clubhouse site with the vehicular entrance off of Prospect Avenue. And uh, we've seen uh, much more attractive, prettier pictures of what this building will look like. What we have not seen, what the university has not submitted is uh, showing how this building sits within the historic streetscape, showing its relationship to the historic buildings to the east and west of it. We have not seen that because it would show that it is incompatible and discordant with the street, the historic streetscape. So the Historic Preservation Commission in 1995 issued a report at the time, uh, this has been referred to already, at the time that it was considering declaring Prospect Avenue, a local historic district. And it said that the development of Prospect represents the fully realized integration of the 19th and early 20th century urban phenomena, self-perpetuating clubs. There is no campus in the United States that has what Princeton has, which is individual private eating clubs all lined up on one street. This is unique in the entire country. The clubhouses are characterized, this is language from the report, by front lawns and mature landscaping, which emphasize the deep setbacks. And very specifically, the last or the third bullet here says the, fall for the smaller frame structures, it is referring to 110, 114, and 116 to the east of Ferris Thompson are included in the proposed district because they were moved to these sites after club use elsewhere and are part of the district's visual and institutional history. In 2012, the historic preservation reiterated the, uh, the desire to declare an historic district on Prospect Avenue instead of calling it the Prospect Avenue Historic District. In the master plan, it was called the Club Row Historic District. It specifically says buildings and structures on both sides of Prospect Avenue and a portion of Washington Road. We heard testimony before that it did not include the three houses, but clearly it does on both sides of Prospect Avenue. Now, here we are in 1911, and uh, Elizabeth's very excellent report referred to uh, Fielder Beekman cottages. And here are the Fielder Beekman cottages. So here's Prospect Avenue, here's the University Field, 
Here's the Ferris Thompson Wall and Gate. Here's the former Charter Club replaced by the current one. Here's the current cap and gown, current cottage, current elm, and this is Olden Street. Here we have these four houses. And uh, over here we have Key and Seal op occupying what was called uh, the Carroll House, which was another one of these Queen Anne cottages. So th this is now part, this has been moved to 110 Prospect to make way for, uh, for Cloister Inn and, uh, I mean, excuse me, for the new Key and Seal building. And these four buildings were moved to make way for Cloister Inn and for a larger charter, uh, charter clubhouse. This building is now at 114 Prospect, and this one is now at 116 Prospect. They are part of the district's visual and institutional history, as the HPC's 1995 report said. Here is the Carroll House, occupied by Key and Seal at this time when this postcard was issued. Here's the former Charter Club, same site as the new one. This tower club is a former cottage club building that tower took over. This is now on the site of 91. This building was added onto in 2014. And here you see the addition in the front of it, a Georgian revival addition. You can just barely see there's a little bit of the Carroll house peeking out from the back of the building. This is clearly part of the district's visual and institutional history. Here is 110 Prospect, virtually the same, losing a few details on the outside, but virtually the same as it was up the street. Here is the back of the building, and here is the Queen Anne House that was originally called the Carroll House. It was mentioned that these buildings have some additions. So naturally, over a period of time, as these buildings were adapted to uses, they had some additions put on, this, on the outside. And you can see that these additions were done very carefully to bend, blend in with the historic character of the buildings. Here is 114 Prospect. And this is very interesting. This appears to be uh, possibly be a new porch, but a lot of the rest of the building, the scallop shingles, the overhang, looks like even the windows, shutters uh, might all be original, uh, the front doors. And here again, uh, part of the back may be an addition, but look how careful, how carefully it was designed to blend in with the original architecture. And here you can see all three of the houses have uh, stone foundations when they were moved here. Now, besides the architectural history and besides the fact that this is part of the district's visual history, it's also part of the institutional, these three buildings are also part of the history of Princeton University. It turns out that a number of very important faculty members lived in these buildings. And so it's easy to think that because of their proximity to the campus, that they were very desirable uh, residences for faculty. They're closer, closer than the white city buildings, a little further to the to the east and they're very prominent. And uh, you can see here, this building was the residence of Erwin Panofsky. And he was called, or he has been called the most influential art historian of the 20th century. Uh, other, other very important faculty members that we have been able to identify so far as occupants of these buildings include uh, art historian Thomas Kaufman, uh, a woman named Froma Zeitlin, who was a very prominent classic scholar who lived in one of these houses for a number of years, and the architect Anthony Vidler, who was a very prominent teacher at the architecture school for a very long time. So there's a history to these houses that has not really been fully investigated. And I think it would reveal that after these houses were moved here, 
they became part of the university's uh, provision of faculty housing. And in fact, uh, and in fact um, they uh, were residences of very important people. There's an article about Erwin Panofsky living in this house that talks about Albert Einstein visiting him there. So there is a great deal of history here that I think could lend itself to establishing the, or as additional evidence of the eligibility of these buildings. Here is number 116. Uh, Professor uh, Kaufman lived at this building for a number of years. Uh, you can see up on the right photograph, uh, on the upper right, it has what's called a sleeping porch. And that sleeping porch is, uh, it looks like it's been enclosed. And this may have some other changes. Look at all those little, uh, look at all those windows with the uh, small divided lights on the facade. They appear to be a, original windows. You know, we have not received any documentation of these houses. None that I am aware of has been submitted to the public uh, on the inside or outside of these houses, uh, documenting them as not significant. Nothing has been submitted showing what's on the inside of these buildings. I made a request uh, through Kristen to take a walk through these buildings. I've been an historic preservation consultant since 1985 and an architectural historian. And I've been in many historic buildings, even in very poor shape. And I, and, uh, I said, I would like to see how much original material remains in these houses. And uh, she said that, that uh, access was not possible. Um, in any case, even if the interior of these buildings has been altered, so some of the original fabric has been removed, Historic Preservation Commission and National Register designation normally does not include the interior of historic properties. It just includes the exterior. And you can see that these three houses maintain a very high level of integrity from their original construction and their adaptive reuse here for faculty housing. They are uh, are they individually eligible for the National Register as we heard? The answer is probably not as we heard, but are they collectively eligible as contributing buildings to the historic district? Absolutely. And they should not be under, uh, unnecessarily demolished. So preserving the integrity of the Princeton Historic District and the Historic Prospect Streetscape. We all need to keep in mind that Prospect Avenue is a public street. It's not Ivy Lane and Western Way where everybody is perfectly comfortable with the university doing, uh, you know, building what it would like on its private streets. The best sustainable action, the university promotes sustainability. We're very happy that it does. And the best sustainable action is the existing building with its embodied carbon. The siting of Court Club on the south side of Prospect is a key component of its historic significance that would be lost in a move and a 180 degree rotation. Inserting an incompatible building will bifurcate the district, isolating its east and irreparably harming its significance. Moving court club and three historic houses will set a precedent for more encroachment on prospect. I know that we heard testimony that this is not the case, but this absolutely sets a precedent. Once, once this once 91 Prospect is moved across the street and these historic buildings are, the three historic houses are destroyed, uh, it's very easy to think that in the future, five, 10, 15 years from now, some more, the university will come along and say that it has good reason to demolish another uh, or remove one, another of the 
uh, four other clubhouses that it owns. And so this is a very dangerous precedent for this and other historic districts in town. And what it really comes down to is the university has not identified a compelling reason to justify this damage. The most that we've heard is that the university wants strong connectivity onto Prospect Avenue. And everyone recognizes that. The university has adequate space on both sides of, uh, of Court Club to have its connectivity. The area around there that comes up to Prospect Avenue was not identified as one of its major nodes. When you get out there, you know, what do you confront? You confront the parking garage. And so, you know, this is not a major node at the intersection of its connectivity to Prospect Avenue. And like I said, if the university had instructed its architects from the beginning to preserve Court Club and still have a distinguished gateway or connectivity, pedestrian and truck access on the open land that it owns on either side of Court Club, then certainly the architects would have followed that, that, uh, that, you know, that uh, instruction. So we ask the HPC members to reject the university's application. I know that Julie said uh, this is a courtesy review but we asked the members to, uh, to write that this, the university's application is not appropriate for the historic district. As Sandy said, uh, he and I and Carl, uh, uh, Carl Pettit have been reaching out to the university since last October to try, and can, to try and encourage the university to develop a design that follows National Park Service policy by keeping Court Clubhouse in place and maintains the character and significance of the streetscape and the Princeton Historic District. Thank you very much for your uh, concern and attention to these very important issues, which will again set a major precedent for not only this historic district, but other historic district districts and sites in Princeton. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Clifford. Elizabeth, um, do you wanna proceed with the next um, person? Madam, yes, Madam Chair, um, I, I did get a request for um, Carl Petty to um, move with this presentation, so I did- You're, you're fading out, so. <laughs> Carl Petty is promoted to panelists to put a summary on this okay. presentation. Carl Pettit. Um, okay. Okay. Um, as introduced, I am Carl Pettit. I'm a member of the class of 67 and a board member of the Princeton Prospect Foundation. I'm an architect. And my primary clients uh, as an architect have been higher education institutions for whom I provided master plans and design services for individual buildings. Um, I just want to underscore that uh, Sandy, Clifford, and I have been um, really collaborating uh, together to try to uh, influence the university in conversations that we've had with Ron, uh, McCoy, and Christian. And uh, all of the comments made uh, to this point, uh, I support wholeheartedly. So I'm not going to, you know, uh, reiterate uh, them individually, but in just reflecting on a couple of issues. Uh, presented uh, in the design for the uh, new campus. Um, I certainly would argue that the proposed, um, I'll call it dense planting of trees and gravel uh, forecourt in front of the uh, theorist building really is out of character with the, um, the streetscape uh, indicated uh, by all the other clubhouses. In fact, uh, along the sidewalks, you will find either a hedgerow or a masonry wall. It sort of is the threshold into that uh, front lawn, which really is a special feature. Um, and I think that that um, really uh, I see as a problem. Second of all, 
The uh, building facades uh, uh, indicated in the renderings and perspectives that Ron um, uh, presented have a, a masonry aspect to them. Uh, in fact, it's brick. And uh, I, I would maintain that, uh, you know, the material proposed for the theorist building, the uh, uh, IFAS material, which is, is white, uh, really fights against the uh, materiality of the other clubs. Uh, because as in his arsenal, he certainly has a masonry uh, facade uh, that would be much more appropriate. But um, again, I support um, Sandy's and, and Clifford's uh, uh, presentation recently provided, and uh, I'd like to turn the rest of the uh, discussion over to the other uh, folks in the public audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Okay, Elizabeth, let's keep going. You're on mute. Oh, you're on mute, Elizabeth. Sorry. Um, Christine Lewandowski has asked to be next because she has a time restriction, so I'm elevating her in. Oh. Hi. Okay, great. Hi. 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 Good afternoon. My name is Christine Lewandowski, and I am a licensed pl professional planner in the state of New Jersey and a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I served 33 years in the employ of three municipalities, including the last 26 years of those 33 years as the Princeton Township and the, municipal, uh, and the municipality of Princeton's deputy development officer, deputy zoning officer, and its first historic preservation officer. I've read the staff reports and reviewed the plans and I have the following comments. I do not support the intrusion of the Princeton University project into the historic district and streetscape. I do not support the demolition of three historic homes and the moving of the court eating club. I do not support the proposed landscaping and building of the proposed new college. Uh, yeah, I guess it is not a college, it's more of a um, school into the historic district. These proposed actions upon a residential street are without precedent. I heartily support the report of the Princeton Prospect Foundation's report and its conclusions and recommendations that were outlined by Clifford Zink. I also support the recommendation of the report of Elizabeth Kim, the historic preservation officer. The university could be praised for starting an engineering and environmental engineering school but it is quite ironic that the proposed project will bring great environmental damage to an existing developed historic streetscape. It will take away the stored energy in the buildings the university proposes to demolish, and it will use much additional energy in the demolition of these houses and the moving and reconstruction of the large court masonry building. The former court eating club should be incorporated into the design of the new college. This will keep the existing streetscape and provide an old world design juxtaposed with the modern structure. The modern structure would be hidden behind the eating clubs and it would be in keeping with the university's 2016 master plan. Princeton may have a history of moving buildings, but this is a radical departure of demolition and introduction of changes in the streetscape. The moving of buildings was mostly done in Princeton at a time when there were no ordinances or guidelines. We now have the tools of ordinances and guidelines in the present. So the former court eating club should be incorporated into the design of the new college. The demolition of the three historic houses and the movement of court changes the mental maps and images 
we have a prospect streetscape. In me, it creates a negative visceral response. When I first heard of the university's proposal, I just couldn't believe it. Kevin White, in his landmark planning book, The Image of the City, reflects on the way people create mental maps and images of the city where they live and work. His book studies different characteristics of cities that help people create personal metal, mental images to help them navigate towns and cities. The municipal land use law requires positive reasons to be proven for the C2 variance the applicant has requested. It has to include that the benefits of the proposed deviation outweigh its detriments and that the proposal is better for the community than the zoning requirement. Its de deviation does not outweigh its detriments and the proposal is not better for the community. The university cites in its variance application that they are improving the current conditions and that a detrimental impact on the neighboring prospect apartment sites is not a concern. They say it is not a concern because they own the Princeton apartments. This project is in their own self-interest. Um, the municipal land use law uses the word community and it requires the applicant to notify property owners within 200 feet of the variance request. This list of owners within 200 feet is on the third page of the applicant's minor site plan for 91 prospect. I counted the properties, there's 64, and the university owns 21 of them. The community though is very, very much more than the adjacent university property. The community is of the people who work and live there. The university is altering the perception of the streetscape by the demolition of these three houses and the moving of a national register building. And they're introducing landscaping and a structure at the court site that has no um, relatability to the streetscape. This variant should be denied as it does not have the benefits that the proposed deviation outweigh its detriments and the proposal is not better for the community than the zoning requirement. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, Elizabeth, let's keep going. Okay. Person I will bring in is Professor Martin. Okay. Okay. Can Mr. you Martin. turn on your video and unmute? Oh, there we go. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, letting me speak. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm Ava Martin, and as a Princeton alumna and a scholar of intellectual and aesthetic history, I would like to speak a little bit more about the historical and cultural legacy of the three Victorians on Prospect Avenue. As I've walked or ridden past these homes on my way to campus, I've often reflected on the luminaries that have lived there over the years and the tremendous contributions to scholarship that has taken place behind their windows. As detailed in a 2012 article by Thomas Kaufman, these unassuming turn of the century dwellings have been the spaces where some of the most celebrated minds of the last century, lived, gathered, exchanged ideas, and wrote. In the 1930s, the center of this vibrant intellectual life was at 114 Prospect, in the home of Erwin Panofsky. A giant in art history, Panofsky wrote some of his most important texts 
at 114 Prospect, including studies and iconology, a work which shook art history in its era and has a lasting impact today. Another great art historian, W.S. Heckscher, followed Panofsky to Princeton, and he spent his first night in the United States at 114 Prospect. The famous English literature professor, Rensselaer Lee, author of Ut Pictora Poesis, met Panofsky in his living room at 114, and there they discussed Spencer's three graces, the connections between word and image and conversations that helped found interdisciplinary studies in the 20th century. In the 1940s, Oliver Strunk, arguably the most influential musicologist of his time, lived at 114 Prospect, and there he conceptualized and wrote source readings in music history. Some of the great scholars who found inspiration in the Prospect Victorians are still living. Professor Froma Zeitlin, Princeton's leading scholar of ancient Greek literature and philosophy until 2010, author of Playing the Other and recipient of a 2016 honorary doctorate from Princeton University, lived and wrote for a very long time at 114 Prospect. Thomas D. Kaufman, a legend in Renaissance and early, mo early modern art history, the Marquand Professor of Art and Archaeology, whose global and collaborative approach to the history of art has profoundly impacted my own graduate work as, men, as well as countless others, lived at 116 Prospect for 10 years in the 80s and 90s. I understand why university architects wish to build a theorist's pavilion for the 21st century. They have not presented a convincing case for tearing down the actual and historic theorist's pavilion in the Queen Anne's on Prospect Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, let's keep going. Okay. Hey. Um, person is Lewis Hamilton. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, I see. Hello. Hello, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Lewis Hamilton. I'm, I, um, I'm an historian um, at another university. Um, I live around the corner from these buildings uh, on Murray Place. And I want to underscore um, a point that's been made by Mr. Zink that given the university's property holdings on Murray Place and in the area, this is a very dangerous precedent for the historic homes of the area. Mr. McCoy said that Princeton has respect for the principles of historic preservation but in the 11 years I've lived here, I have seen um, two late 19th century buildings uh, torn down on Olden and William Street, the destruction of er the early 20th century Korea house at Olden and Prospect, and these, the slow mo uh, motion uh, destruction of the area further isolates an orphan's buildings and gives credence to the idea that the buildings are not significant or isolated and can be destroyed um, in the future. Uh, in addition, in the community as a whole, University's uh, incredibly generous subsidies of mortgages um, for faculty members puts an exerts an enormous pressure of gentrification and on, in the community and further promotes the destruction of smaller traditional homes uh, in the area. I would propose that the buildings be pre preserved as is in support of Mr. Zink's uh, point, but more so I prefer uh, propose that they be uh, restore, uh, returned to residential use either as affordable housing or given as reparations to the descendants of Princeton's enslaved peoples uh, from the 18th uh, century into the 19th century. And that would not only um, restore, preserve uh, a piece of history in the community, but it would restore uh, uh, in a bigger sense part of Princeton's historic character. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Elizabeth, let's, next person. Next person, next person is Melanie Stein. 
Okay. Hello. I hope everyone Hi. can see me. Sorry, I've, I see from a prior call, I've got a cicada in the background, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, I'm a, I am a uh, resident of Prospect Avenue, and I wanted um, it to be clear that there are residents of Prospect Avenue who support the project, who find it exciting, who find it um, inspiring, welcoming, and are looking um, toward all the value it has. And in fact, I would urge um, the, the panelists to uh, recommend the approval of the project. And I will say, you know, after I, I first heard about this issue uh, through a posting on Nextdoor, I think it was last week, by someone I do know in the community and have great respect for, and I got in my car and I drove down the street to look what the issues were. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I'll observe that in looking at the three places to be torn down, they didn't look uh, particularly historic to me in sense of grand architecture. And if we think about what's going on in the larger Princeton community, I think we have many bigger issues as a community that we should be focusing on rather than um, these, these three things. And I, I will say I welcome, I am a graduate of the university and I graduated in the 80s. And to me, Prospect Avenue and the clubs in the 80s was a place of exclusion. The hedges that were there, I see as symbols of um, a past history that some of us uh, might be happy that we progressed from. And I find the idea of pathways connectivity to the campus, um, the activities that um, I know many community members welcome. I attend things not just as a, you know, an alumnus, but as a member of the community. I look forward to all of that. And I look forward to the fact that there'll be world-class research in theoretical and experimental things that will hopefully uh, progress our society coming out of buildings right on Prospect Avenue. That's exciting to me. And I really think that we should think about um, what uh, could be served by the research that would be going on in the buildings and be proud of them. And also think about the things that we've just seen in the images of the native plantings of the ADA, of the accessibility to the community and all of those issues, it doesn't mean that it's perfect or that there are concerns. Personally, I'm concerned about traffic and transportation, but I would urge my community members on this, uh, uh, on this um, uh, webcast to think about the larger context of the issues we have in our community on transportation, on fabric, on architecturally renewing our educational structures, on the tree canopy, on resiliency to climate change. Uh, we need native planting, stormwater. The university is helping us address some of these issues in the larger context of the research it's going. And I really think that all of the energy that is being put into this fight about tearing down these three not particularly wonderful homes could be better used in solving some of those larger issues of our community, of which, by the way, I have great concern, and in particular about transportation. And uh, I would be interested to hear from the university how they're planning to handle um, the increased uh, you know, transport issues we might see around all of this new development that's going on, rather than you know, this issue about these three homes. So, and, and in closing, I will just say that I moved to Princeton at the time of the Dinky fight. And, you know, one of the most discouraging things about moving to Princeton, where I moved from New York City, but I've lived in a lot of places and around the world, the most discouraging thing about Princeton is how anything becomes this like monumental fight, the most reasonable proposals become this monumental fight. And I just urge everyone to think of what, what the Lewis Center has given us all after all those years of those dinky fights and what we could have been better doing with all that energy spent on the dinky fight, maybe solving some of the other transportation issues in town. 
those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move on. on. Yes. To yep. Adrian. Oh, sorry about that. Hello. Um, my name is Adrian Trevisan. I'm an architectural historian. I live uh, over by the high school in a Queen Anne, Victoria. Uh, and I just wanted to say briefly that um, I thought Clifford Zink's presentation uh, ticked all the important boxes, mentioned all the uh, important uh, points, uh, particularly the concept of the streetscape and the embodied energy. Um, one thing that he mentioned that I just want to underline is, is uh, my concerns about precedent. Uh, as we, I think it was mentioned, the university owns the prospect apartments. Uh, and I guess a step after this could be the university has a long-term view, could be the prospect apartments coming down. Uh, the white city uh, that I think we all know, the university has for some of them, if not all of them, uh, an option to uh, take the buildings uh, back on a three year uh, advance notice. So in 25 or 50 or hundred years, um, we could see modern buildings pushing all, well, I suppose not all of us, but the, the town could see modern buildings pushing over to, um, to Harrison and again, losing the historic fabric of the, uh, of the town. So I just wanted to uh, mention that to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next person will be Kip Cherry. Okay. Kip, can you turn your video on? Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, there's no question about the importance of this applied science complex. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity for the university and for the community. And I look forward to a lot of really fantastic, iconic, modernistic design along Ivy Lane. And uh, I think that this building uh, represents a, a major opportunity uh, for the university and for the town uh, to have a transition building that pulls together essentially Ivy Lane and Prospect Avenue. And Prospect Avenue uh, is uh, obviously been discussed quite a bit about its historic value. I think uh, that um, the fact that it is an evolutionary history is something that uh, we need to keep in mind now because we are now taking another step in that evolution. And uh, I think that preserving the corridor's character is very important to that evolution. And I think that uh, making the new building, the modernistic building, work uh, is very important. And I think maintaining the uh, court club is an important part of that thinking. There are many star architects uh, around the world, and I've had a lot of experience with them, who have uh, incorporated um, historic buildings into their designs. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit odd because on three sides is a modernist design and on the fourth side is an historical design. And, um, but that happens because of the importance of the building and the context and it's easy to do. It's not a big issue for any good architect. So I'm very concerned that we are ignoring uh, the importance of preserving the corridor in that we are talking about demolishing uh, three houses that have uh, obvious value uh, and um, I want to discuss too the uh, topo topographic issue that was raised uh, because again, any good architect can handle a topographic change and that's not, that should not be an issue. Uh, and besides that, uh, the topography affects the new building regardless. So um, having an historic building at the, as an appendage to it uh, shouldn't be an issue at all. Uh, and when you talk about ramps and steps, uh, that's just a natural way to handle any top topographic issue both exterior and interior. There's no reason why you can't have very, very convivial space uh, with um, that kind of um, uh, setup. And um, I would hope that students can easily uh, traverse any steps or ramps that might be involved. Um, so um, I think that um, we also have talked about sustainability 
And quite frankly, the most sustainable thing you can do is to maintain an historic building and not tear it down or move it. Uh, so um, I think that if the university wants to be consistent in trying to be the most sustainable possible, that consistency means retaining the uh, court club and retaining the three uh, Queen Anne buildings across the street. Um, also, um, I want to talk about the variances uh, very quickly because that hasn't really been brought up much. Christine Lewandowski brought them up, but of course that's the um, elephant in the room because uh, in order to uh, move the building, there are variances involved. And um, in order to get a variance, you have to have um, what they call in the uh, MLUL, the state statute, a peculiar condition. I do not see any peculiar conditions in this situation. I don't think the topography is a peculiar condition. I don't think that the lots are narrow or any of that sort of thing. None of those are peculiar conditions. And at the same time, um, the MLUL instructs the planning board to look at uh, the public good and whether the uh, variances would create a detriment to the public good. And I would argue that um, there is a detriment to the public good in that um, we will lose um, three um, historic, well, we'll, we'll relocate one historic structure out of its location and diminish its value and lose three other historical structures. So I think that really is not the way to go. And I would hope that the university would reconsider because I think great design means uh, tying together the context and the environment. And um, the environment is the physical place. And um, I think that the university's strength is it in its ability to tie together the historical and, uh, and, and future environment of that campus and to send that message to the students because that is a part of um, considering applied science and, and uh, engineering is to consider how to, how to draw together the uh, historical um, uh, world and the, and the future world. And so I think that creates a really great message for the kids. And um, I would hope that the university would put more emphasis on that message. I think that there could easily be a glassy um, entrance tucked in behind the uh, court club that would provide um, so-called presence on Prospect Avenue without uh, uh, violating the character of Prospect. So I think that would be uh, a compromise that's well worthwhile. As far as the programmatic requirements of the building, I don't know any buildings that don't require classroom space, office space, conference space. Those are the kinds of spaces that would work very well in the uh, core club as, as an appendage to the building. So I really think that um, uh, just widening our imaginations a little bit would make a lot of sense. Uh, and I do think the fact that it prospect is a public road is something that needs to be considered that the town does have a, a vested interest in this road and in the life of the community as affected by the eating clubs over the years. And I don't want to diminish that history. Some of it hasn't been great, uh, such as the confrontation with Sally Franks, for instance, when she wanted uh, entry into a eating club. But that's part of history, and it's and the the beauty of it is how the university community moves beyond that history. It all goes back, you know, to the American Revolution, and uh, so history is part of our blood and part of our context. And we need to uh, uh, elaborate on it. We need to be excited by it, and we need to preserve it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Martha. Hi, uh, you're muted. Good evening and thank you for hearing me. I'm really calling briefly in support of both Clifford Zink and Christine Lewandowski, who I think made the case really beautifully for the point that I was going to make, which is uh, historic preservation is not just the buildings. Historic preservation is the context and the streetscape. I've been involved in historic preservation through my own house since I moved here. <clears throat> and when I think about an alumni going back and finding their eating club across the street, you'd feel dizzy. Uh, that's part of what historic preservation needs to 
hold on to. And uh, as to Kip's point about transition, I do feel as though the eating clubs provide a really lovely natural transition into Princeton residential area, Riverside District, that is lovely. And the, the fact that there are other options, good options, I would imagine, that don't require any of this would seem to me to be reason enough to say, well, then why? Um, I don't understand why they have to do something to destroy historic preservation when they have other options. Okay, thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Martha, could you provide your last name for the record? Yes, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Reinhardt, R-I-N-E-H-A-R-T. Thank you. You're welcome. Person is Thomas Kaufman. Hi, Thomas. Can you turn on your video? Trying to turn on my video, too. I don't know why it's not. Can you hear me at least? Yes. I'm sorry that the, um, I don't know why the video is not working, but there's some issue here. Anyway, I, after all the nice things that were said about me, and there was my point was uh, already, uh, so I, I hesitated to uh, participate in this, but I did want to talk about uh, one uh, further aspect about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the historic personage, namely Owen Panofsky, who lived uh, in the, um, in 114. I should add that I'm Mark Juan, professor of uh, Art and archaeology, and I've lived in Princeton for 44 years, going on to 45 now. And um, I'm a beneficiary of many aspects of the university's use of these houses, and I'm currently in a uh, whatever you call it, a Gray Farms house, uh, which also had been moved. Um, what I wanted to address was uh, the significance of Panofsky and his presence there in 1934 to 38. Um, that is to say that Panofsky, just for those who are not in my field, as most of you aren't, um, does have the importance that Jeffrey Smith uh, assigned to him as being the perhaps the most important art historian of the 20th century, and uh, a person who, in fact, was important for the uh, rise in our field and who also taught at the university as well as being a member of the Institute for Advanced Study from 19, well, from before 34, but from 33 or so on to his death in 1968, and was responsible for the formation of many uh, people, both directly and indirectly. Uh, his widow, I should add, is still a resident of, uh, of Princeton. Uh, he, uh, the point I would like to make that hasn't been made so far as that the existence of uh, 114 Prospect and the fact that that house was made, uh, was available to him and uh, the fact that he had people visit him there or stay with him there like Heckscher uh, underscores a positive aspect of Princeton's history which should not be forgotten. Namely, it's reception of uh, refugees here uh, from the Nazis and people who, like Heckscher, were anti-Nazi. So that needs to be stated when we're talking about Princeton history. And I would also just ask, and I, I suppose that the university and uh, colleagues like uh, Dr. Bizdoc, uh, who has spo uh, spoken, uh, I suppose that they were not aware that he had lived there because I can't imagine that uh, the Institute for Advanced Study or, or the university would tear down uh, Einstein's house. So that's uh, all I, I would say. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for listening to me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is um, Bash Martin family. Okay.
Hi, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me start my video. Okay, there we go. Hi. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Jim Bash, and I've lived here in Princeton for 21 years. I love the university. I'm a big booster, and it brings so much to our town. I have supported almost all of their projects over the decades of being a homeowner here. Being an engineer myself, I am in favor of the new engineering complex to replace the aging EQUAD facilities. And what we have seen is that most residents and alumni attending today here, and I expect elsewhere, are similarly supportive and do not take issue with the project generally and the benefits it will bring to the university and to our community. But the university already has nearly 15 acres for this site, their single largest expansion in modern history. The complex is almost entirely along Ivy Lane with all the space they need there and even an unused two acre area that is currently labeled future development. You can see it in Mr. McCoy's slides. The sprawl up to prospect is unnecessary and encroaches on a residential neighborhood destroying three beautiful Victorian era homes, which are rich in history and were actually on that street first, predating all extant eating clubs. While moving the contributing court clubhouse out of the Princeton Historic District to only gain an additional half acre in the process. For some years now, while walking by and along Prospect, as I do so often, I've noticed the three Victorians have not been well taken care of and I haven't understood why. I almost wrote Kristen Applegate about it on a couple of occasions. But just like any other building they own, the university has the responsibility for their proper upkeep. So it is puzzling to see the caretaker to make a claim here of any lost perceived integrity. But each of the Victorians supports the other in a cohesive historical group. By contrast, court would be isolated to where it doesn't belong and cut off from Eating Club Row. It is damaging to the history and legacy of this grand avenue. And to most people's sensibilities, it is avoidable sprawl. There is no academic, educational, or research imperative for it to happen. In fact, there is a vacant lot immediately adjacent to 91 Prospect with plenty of street frontage to provide a third Northern access point to the new buildings on the East Campus similar to the other two entrances that Mr. McCoy highlighted further west on the street. Princeton has been the number one or number two university in the country every year since 1993. So there seems little risk that everything is going to go down the tubes if this edifice is not constructed in that precise location, but elsewhere on the vast site while maintaining campus connectivity from both sides of the court clubhouse, plus the other access points referenced. The current plan also continues a pattern of encroachment and demolition in residential neighborhoods in recent years that was referenced by other commenters as departmental buildings creep ever closer to where residents live. Mr. McCoy calls it, quote, a preservation story in the presentation that I attended last week, but we wouldn't have such a large public outcry over 600 signatures in just a week, if that were the reality. A true preservation story would entail protecting and preserving our town's history and architectural treasures, not displacing or destroying them. Would a real preservation story propose replacing a stately 1929 manor within an historic district with a 2024 edifice that is out of place and incompatible with the surrounding neighborhood and streetscape most here are clearly saying no. I've talked to a lot of my neighbors about this over the past week since learning of it myself. Like me, most people simply weren't aware of this aspect of the plan and most were distressed to hear it. But disappointingly, many I talked to were flat out cynical. They tell me it doesn't matter, they don't listen and nobody will stop them. Is this really true in our town? Are there no checks and balances? Should our community not bother safeguarding the historic district neighborhood from unchecked expansion? There must be another way. Can't we find a workable solution and restore faith that the university will listen and respond? 
that the town will draw the line at a bridge too far? Per municipal ordinance, this historical preservation commission is charged to quote, preserve the integrity and authenticity of the historic preservation districts and to ensure the compatibility of new structures therein. So we're all waiting here today for your decision. And that's why all these fine folks are present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I don't see any more electronic hands raised, but I did send out a, um, uh, a chat to everyone in the public pool to let them know. Okay. Please raise their hands. Well, then I think we can take a break in the public comment. And um, we would move on to our own commission and we can actually get uh, comments from our, our fellow commissioners. Uh, Madam Chair, there is one hand raised. Do you want to hold off on that? Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, we should finish up the public comment. Okay, um, David Kinsey will be promoted. Oh, okay. And there's, and there's another person too. Okay. Um, David, can you turn on your video? Oh, uh, there you are. Hi. There it is, okay. Hello, one and all. Hi. My name's David Kinsey. I'm a licensed uh, professional planner in New Jersey like Christine. I'm a fellow of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I was actually born in Princeton, and I've lived here since 1985, and I'm a double graduate alumnus of the university. And I've been teaching planning at Princeton since 1998. Uh, my day job is as a professional planner working throughout New Jersey and in Connecticut. You've heard many eloquent, important statements today. I support wholeheartedly the overall project of the university to build spectacular new complexes for great research and teaching. But it's the entrance on Prospect Avenue that is problematic. As we've learned this today, the proposal is to have a theorist pavilion, a smaller structure on Prospect Avenue. That can happen somewhere in this complex, but by preserving the court building. In fact, maybe even the court club is appropriate. It has spaces where people might be able to gather, think, individual offices talk, what theorists uh, would do. And there's certainly plenty of room for connectivity with the portion of that lot and the existing vacant lot. Connectivity for a road, for people to walk, for pathways. But the current scheme uh, is simply just not appropriate for, and simply doesn't comply with all the standards that you've heard so eloquently and clearly expressed, particularly in Clifford Zink's presentation. Um, the, planning issue before the planning board, the critical one is the variance. This commission gives advice to the planning board and the key advice that I suggest you offer is to accept wholeheartedly your staff members review, an excellent report by Ms. Kim, but with the addition to point out that it's the benefits must outweigh the detriments. She, she made the point but the benefits need to be outlined. What are the benefits from this destruction of a registered site, a, reg a building in a registered district and demolishing the three structures compared to uh, the obvious detriment of all of that anti-preservation activity? The planning rationale has simply not been provided to you to support a recommendation favoring the variance that has been requested. So in conclusion, I urge you to advise the planning board to reject the variance application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, one more person. Okay. Thomas Kaufman. Okay. He will be elevated to- That was us. I think I think it's enough has been said, and I I, I think that uh, all points have been expressed, and I certainly agree with uh, my former neighbor, there, Mr. Kinsey. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. One, one more.
more person raise their hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, last name is, I believe it's Suzo. So I will be promoting that okay. person. Suazo, hi. Um, Sorry. Uh, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I uh, just also wanted to, I appreciated that last comment. And um, I think the plans look really fabulous and they'll be bringing a lot of things to the university, but it just seems that somebody made a choice to push the project this little bit up to Prospect Avenue. And, and instead of trying to work around that, it's just been forced on everything else in the plan. So the, the buildings will be a great improvement, um, but it just seems a real blind eye to the, the site and, and unnecessary. And, and uh, to reiterate, I didn't see any, I don't see any convincing reason that we should have a, uh, a over, forget the historic issue of it and, and uh, allow for variance. Uh, I, I also think it would be uh, great if there were uh, more opportunity if, if things are opening up that people could come in and look at the plants, physical plants themselves to get more of a view. But um, I know at the times that may not be a possibility, but I, I would uh, also encourage the commission to uh, reject the application. Thank you for your efforts and time. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Suazo, can you provide your first name for the record? Sure, it's Paul. Paul, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suazo. All right. Not I not think... not no more. Yes. I don't see anyone <laughs> else's hand. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to finish it up here. Okay. We can't hear you. I'm not do um I don't I don't see anyone. No, I, I didn't either. I believe that there aren't any other hands raised at this time. Okay, so we're done. Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Oh, okay. So I'm opening this up to the commission members. Um maybe starting with Elric, any comments? Uh, I, I, no need to uh, reiterate. Uh, uh, what I will say is, uh, first of all, I'm not I'm not overly impressed with the odd compilation of different. Uh, it's very busy design for this whole thing, um, and I find a lot of it to be politically correct, but pretty aesthetically wanting. Aside from all that. Um, it, it's obvious that, that some of the best architecture is 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 that which which faces an, an adverse condition and actually makes it into a, um, a a prominent design feature. And the opportunity is here for just that. Um, I, uh, I I just think it needs to be revisited. I think the university certainly can call upon. Um, of professionals who, who can look at this and and scrutinize better way of of uh, of, 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 of uh, presenting this very different uh, compilation of buildings um, drawn through the Prospect Avenue experience. Um, I agree with those who think that this is just going to lead to more um, to, to further expansion. Just in the 25 years I've been on this commission, we've sat through um, the, the removal, particularly of, of the community along Alexander. And I think partially in response to that, we have worked diligently to try to preserve as much as possible the character of the Witherspoon Jackson area. Um, this is, as someone said, the, the clubhouses are, uh, are a wonderful transition from the, the university campus and the residential area to the east. One thing I 
one final point, and that is when we considered the 20 Nassau project over the last year, one of the most telling parts of that was their, their, the, the study that had been made of the impact of, of, of the, the, the new structures on the community along, along Bank Street. Um, Prospect Avenue got that name because it was a prospect. It was supposed to be a, people have told me um, that that was favored over places like University Play, uh, of, of Library Place and whatever, because of the helpful breezes that would come up from the Millstone, Stony Brook Valley and the long views. Um, my sense is that the, the height of those buildings is going to be particularly intrusive on the experience of those buildings on the south side of Prospect, the rear, uh, the southern facing um, um, uh, 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 elevations. And I would urge that at the very least, some, um, some uh, similar study be made to the one that we looked at on 20 Nassau. I'm interested to hear from everyone else. I particularly appreciate um, the people who have who've taken on this um, effort and the neighbors and members of the community who voice their concerns. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, Shirley, I just wanted to ask you, because um, you know a lot about the clubs, um, what, what you think of this project? I muted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I had the pri um, privilege of having lunch with Mr. Zink, um, actually at our Robert's house um, about two years ago. And he talked about his book and he gave me a, an autographed copy. And I said, there's something missing in this book. I said, it's a lot of architectural buildings and it's beautiful, but you don't have anything about the people who sustain these buildings, who sustain the inside, who were the cooks, who were the cleaners. Um, our family, if you talk to any member uh, of a family who's been here at least 20 years, um, they can tell you that their mother or their father or an uncle worked at the avenue. And when I give a tour and I stop in front of the Robeson house, and there's a little uh, part of the Robeson house where, because it used to be a rooming house after Paul Robeson was no longer in that house. And at the bottom, there was a place where the men who worked on the avenue would come to play cards or to rest. And people would ask me, well, what is the avenue? Well, the avenue was prospect. And I remember my mother ironing her little white apron and saying she's going to work on the avenue or my uncle who worked on the avenue, which was wonderful for us because you know, when you open up a refrigerator, you can get ice cream anytime you want. Well, living on Old Clay Street, we had ice boxes. And when my mother came home with ice cream, that was a big thing. So there were a lot of people who sustained all of those clubs. And one person in particular was Mr. Uh, George Reeves. Anybody who knows um, Jim Floyd, it was Jim Floyd's father-in-law who sustained not only the clubs, but also was the cook for Blairstown. So there was a lot of connection between our community and those eating clubs. And as, a, as an historian of this community, um, I like to keep things historical. And uh, even though I know this is something that the um, university would like to do, I don't see destroying three noted houses um, and moving a building that can be fixed up where it is and not destroy the houses. So that's my connection with the um, with Prospect House and all of our families who sustained and worked on the avenue. All right, thank you, Shirley. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Let's see, uh, Tom, I know you had a lot of comments. I, very good and interesting discussion. I really appreciate all the perspectives being offered. Um, my, uh, I have questions I would just like to ask uh, the university friends and see if uh, in the context of our further discussions, if any of these can be answered. So I'll just list these and Whatever ones are relevant to pick up, I'll be grateful for the answers. First, um, as an alumnus, I'm familiar with the uh, reunion and the post-football traditions of 
uh, returning alumni to uh, work their way up after a football game to Prospect Street for their after game parties. So what is to become of that conduit? I'm not quite seeing how stream, streamlined that conduit will become after this new building. Number two, what will happen to the parking lots behind the clubs? Uh, are these currently owned by the university and uh, have they been acquired? Three, I'd like to kindly ask what has happened indeed to the trees along Prospect in the time since I was a university student back in the 70s. Uh, several have been felled, of course, as we have mentioned. Four, what is the future of this parking garage in the midst of all this? That is the real thorn amongst all the roses here. And um, uh, not to invoke a, uh, uh, Charlesian term, but that's the carbuncle that we have to deal with as we try to figure out the whole transition and integration of this should buildings be moved and so on. I would like to understand better what is the future use of the old EAS building. Um, also Ivy Lane, will that be converted to a walkway now without cars? And if that is the case, what is to become of the diverted traffic? Uh, Ms. Stein made a mention to this, and I think this is actually an unspoken issue that needs more discussion uh, elsewhere around town with ideas to create Nassau Street as a one-way street already with a spoon street, the closing of Ivy Lane. This traffic has to go somewhere, and so where do we suppose it's going to go? Um, and I'll leave it there with, uh, these are my questions uh, for comment. All right, well, I'll give the university a few minutes, um, but we can uh, maybe move on to um, Roger and Frida, if you guys have comments. To start, I, I came into this um, thinking it was not a particularly great idea. Listen to the university and was swayed a bit in their direction, but ultimately came out uh, where many of my colleagues are coming up that uh, there's got to be a better way to do this than to uproot uh, the club and move it across the street. It, it just seems like almost like a gimmick to me. Um, on, it, in the favor of the university, they've come before our commission many times and I've always respected the work they've done. We've disagreed with them on occasion, but they've always come up with workable solutions. They are interested in being good stewards of their historic uh, legacy. There's no question about that. I just don't see that um, this solution to connectivity of the, the new buildings to the upper campus is uh, the way to do it. This solution doesn't seem to be uh, workable to me. Okay, thanks. Frida? Um, well, I think most I kind of, I agree with, with most of the comments, um, but there's something Roger said that, that occurred to me when I read all of the text and that was, it seems like sort of a gimmick because why would you move an eating house to a whole other area of the, um, you know, of prospect. And then I think somewhere there, please correct me if I'm wrong, there was a text that said the university will then recommend that that entire area of prospect, including the, 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 the moved um, eating house, the university would recommend that it would be included in a historic district. I think I read something that it seems like a roundabout way to achieve historic district status. So um, yeah, I, I don't understand it. It's, it's quite confusing to me considering the university owns so much land in town. And, and I agree with others who said that um, it, it should really be reconsidered and rethought out. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's where it needs to go because it doesn't- I think it doesn't sound logical to me. All right, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, is, is David still here, David Shore? Yes, he just unmuted himself. I'm here, I'm not dead yet. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just can't see you. So um, please, please put in your two cents. Well, I, I have two cents, two, two thoughts. Um, one, um, rereading the ordinance that establishes the Historic Preservation Commission. And I read where it talks about, indeed it talks about 
properties within a district and those that are not in a district. And that what it really talks about is our working hard to utilize our historic resources. And when I hear a lot of members of the public come forward today who don't even know the distinction perhaps of local historic district, national register district, or things that are noted to be on the master plan as important to the community. What I hear is that a lot of people have faith in the commission trying to protect the qualities of either neighborhood or history or the design context uh, that makes Princeton special. I think that's a very rewarding thing to hear. And I think that the university probably is hearing that loud and clear also. And I would think is saying, gee, what can we do with this design? What input do we give back to our designers to come up with something that's better? And then just a second thought was the, uh, the, the three houses, their history, the small ones that could be uh, easily discarded. They actually have quite a lot of history. And I'm sorry that the uh, consultant uh, discussing the, the, those houses missed this. Those houses have such connection to the event of Prospect Avenue, that those houses were moved in order for Prospect Avenue to become what it became um, and that they are indeed significant to the whole story there. They aren't just throwaway buildings. So those are my, my comments. I, I feel strongly that we're hearing a lot from the community and going back to what I was talking about earlier, what our charge is, I think we have a pretty clear direction of what we're supposed to be doing in terms of our recommendation. That's what I have to say for right now. Thanks, David. Well, I agree. I feel like we have unity here. Um, full disclosure, I studied with someone who studied with someone who studied with Panofsky. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that said, um, I think that the entrance to um, the EAS building the way it's conceived seems very problematic. And I don't think we can recommend the university moving forward without reconsidering the available land nearby and leaving um, the club where it is and just re-examining how um, the circulation would work. But um, I definitely think we're in unity here. And Ed, do you need anything else? I mean, we're, we can, um, kind of go over the memo points, but as far as a, a vote or something goes, do we need to proceed that way or? One more quick question, please, uh, Julie. Sure, Tom. Uh, what is, please forgive me about my naivety, what is the land that people think the university has that should be used instead of the access to Prospect Street? Is there some adjacent land behind or across the street that they're thinking of? Oh, no. Next to the club, there's a vacant lot. Um, so mentioned made by one. And of, so, one of the commenters referred to there's a spot behind the building uh, on Ivy Lane that's reserved for future <clears throat> construction. So somebody had suggested that as well as an alternate location. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, David, you didn't really get a chance to, um, David Cohen, you didn't really get a chance to comment. I don't know if you wanna comment now or. I actually, I try never to comment uh, since I was the liaison and not actually a member of the commission. Um, but I would actually like to hear the answers to Tom's questions that he asked before. He had a whole list of them for the university. And I think before the commission sort of weighs in, it would be interesting to hear the answers to some of those. I thought they were germane. I can do that now, if that would be helpful. That would be great. Okay, so if I captured all of them. I think the first one was about uh, reunions and the um, football games and events uh, and the kind of movement back from, from the stadium district back up to the, uh, the clubs. I think that uh, those pathways would um, sort of 
uh, find new routes. Uh, I think I we tried to make a point in one of the slides. I know I had to go quickly. Um, there's a lot of porosity and movement through the site, both accessible and uh, and through stairs. And so there's a it's less of a straight line as you have with Roper, but um, could be a festive route back up to the to the eating clubs for after game and after event uh, activities. In terms of the parking lots um, for the clubs, uh, we that's the role that Leafy Lane will play. Uh, the clubs that currently have parking that has access um, to uh, Ivy Lane and Western Way would have uh, access via Leafy Lane, which we're providing as part of part of the design. Um, regarding the trees along Prospect, I think that's a you know a bit of incremental destruction of the neighborhood over time. I don't know if there was a moment in time, I have a feeling it was just attrition that the trees gradually died and were not replaced or the utility poles came in, utility lines came in and took out a lot of those, a lot of those trees. So um, I don't, it'd be, it, it's an interesting history, but I have a feeling it's, it's just attrition and uh, people not paying attention to the loss of the, of those beautiful trees, but hopefully we're at a position where we can um, uh, restore them. Uh, the future parking garage uh, that's under construction right now on the where where it, where it has been discussed and approved and permitted. So I don't have the the details of when I don't I can't remember the the, the date when that parking garage is opening, but that's that's under construction. I'm sorry to interrupt, Ron, but Tom was asking about the existing garage behind that yes. and white wall. Ah, that's right. That will continue to play the role that it plays right now. We don't have any plans to um, uh, do anything with that parking garage. So that's not part of our current thinking. Um, we hope a day comes soon when we don't have to build garages, but that hasn't happened so far. When we started this campus plan, we really thought that we would, that we'd be on a trajectory toward that plan, but that hasn't quite happened yet. Um, regarding the EAS building, um, I'm going to I'm going to come to that last um, because I I answered the question incorrectly or not precisely enough in the SPRAB meeting. I'm going to ask Emily to be be prepared to come back and talk about um, the the details of the EAS building. I'll, I'll sketch it in an overview that uh, only a small bit of it would be vacated by these projects. Um, this is an evolutionary development of this neighborhood, and it's really when uh, um, uh, mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and civil engineering, when they move down to this new neighborhood in the future over the next 30 years, that the existing engineering building would be vacated. That's a kind of broad view and, and Emily can jump in and give the uh, details. Um, a question about Ivy Lane, um, Ivy Lane Western Way, would it become a walkway uh, a, a exclusive of vehicular traffic? The answer is no vehicular traffic will continue to use Ivy Lane and Western Way. The demand on Ivy Lane and Western Way will go down significantly for vehicles because the parking garage at the, the new parking garage, which is under construction, will draw traffic down to that parking garage. So our, our traffic study demonstrates that, that uh, Ivy Lane and Western Way become less, less, uh, less uh, crowded with vehicles and not very crowded at all to begin with, but it's very light traffic. It, the design is to propose a, um, um, a uh, advisory shoulders on either side for bicycles to make it more bicycle friendly with a single lane of traffic in the middle that can go both ways. So this is the this is what's done on College Road right now, uh, over between uh, University Place and the graduate the graduate college. Um, so importantly, I wanted to uh, point out about the um, the comments about uh, the the additional property that we have. Um, this, this, at the southeast corner of the site, um, there is a, a footprint for a future building for uh, the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, formerly uh, Electrical ELE. Um, that is not in the distant future. That will happen fairly soon. And uh, that footprint is reserved precisely for that building. So that site is not available. Um, and that goes to the point of um, you know one of one of the reasons why um, we need the site where 91 Prospect is located, and I explained this to uh, Clifford and to Carl in a detailed meeting where we went through where where we reviewed all the plans that they shared with us of alternative strategies. 
Um, those plans do not work because of uh, zoning setbacks and other, other requirements that, that, uh, that are uh, um, impinging on the site. And um, the, uh, so it's really the functional, there is no other place on the site for that, for that program to go and to be programmatically connected to provide the functional requirement between the research labs and the theorist labs. Um, so it's, it's, that is the primary reason. Uh, connectivity is, a, is an, a, an additional reason, but the, uh, uh, the functionality is the, is the primary reason. Um, and then Jimmy just also just one other question uh, that I think um, Frida asked which is just to clarify that what we have offered to do, uh, one, of the, one of the concerns from uh, Clifford um, was that we would be moving uh, 91 Prospect out of the historic district. And so we offered to initiate a conversation with SHPO to redraw the boundaries of the historic district so the building would remain in the historic district. That was the purpose of that. It does, does seem twisted and convoluted, but that, that was the, the sort of purpose of that. So Emily, can you just put some detail on the question that uh, Mr. Pyle asked about the EAS and what, what does and does not move to these new neighborhoods? Certainly, and would it be helpful for me to reshare the site plan so everyone can see the, the future development yeah, area? Yeah, that, 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 would, that would be helpful, yeah. So it's this area here. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the, not just a that's not just a general outline. That's a very precise outline that that's tied to the design of the loading dock and all of the all of the servicing for for this for this site. And the size of the ECE um, yes, yes. program in order to fit within the zoning envelope and required heights and things like that. Uh, so yes, I can just uh, speak briefly about. Um, the two engineering um, entities that are moved down here, um, bioengineering, as uh, Ron stated in the SPRAB presentation, is a new institute uh, that will uh, that is growing out of the chemical and biological engineering department. Uh, these researchers are currently housed mostly in Hoyt, uh, as well as um, a few within the natural sciences uh, over here uh, along Washington. So um, Hoyt will be uh, vacated for the most part. Um, the uh, CBE department is housed in um, in EQUAD, so that's the only um, those are the only attendees uh, or, or occupants of the building that will move out of the um, out of the EQUAD, um, and uh, eventually um, the electrical and computer engineering department will, would move out of EQUAD as well. Great, thank Thanks. you. Um, I just want to check with Tom if uh, he felt his questions were answered. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you very uh, thorough. Thank you. And, and and Tom, I just wanted to add with. All right, you, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Just with this, you were asking about the trees, either related to this or other projects. The university is looking at putting uh, new trees up and down prospect within the right of way. And yeah. I, I can't remember the number, but it's something like 70 or 80 trees. So it's a That's substantial right. number. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. Very intrigued. To, Chris, I'm very intrigued to see the tools of your trade on the wall behind you. <laughs> yeah, that's a collection of incoming arrows. <laughs> They're not on fire though yet. <laughs> All right. So back to business. Um uh are there are, are there any changes of thought or are people pretty much sticking with the, their statements? Um, if so, I think we have uh, the, the makings of a, of a very unified memo. Um, Ed, do you think we need any motions or anything like that? Well, Madam Chair, I think from the, uh, uh, hearing that you just conducted and the comments made by members of HPC that 
there's a, a strong consensus by HPC not to endorse the application as currently proposed and not to encourage the demolition of the three uh, houses nor the relocation of the uh, court uh, club. And I think that would be the uh, basis for the uh, memorandum that we would send to the planning board, which will have to decide the site plan and also have to decide the variance application. Uh, you don't do that, uh, but you can comment about that. But I think from the uh, five or six pages of notes that I have, uh, I think it's pretty clear the consensus of the uh, commission. Madam Chair, can I just make a couple right. of closing comments? Um, just to some, because there were a lot, there were a lot of comments made in the in the public comment and and by the commission. Is, can I just say a few things? Sure. Sure. Yes. So, so I'm under no illusion that I'm going to change <laughs> what was just <laughs> summarized by by Ed, but I, I would like to point out that um, that 91 uh, prospect is not subject to state or federal review and that the three houses are not in any, uh, any uh, local district. Uh, so there, there's no regulatory control over them. I, I really wanna emphasize the functional incompatibility between 91 Prospect and um, the Chemical and Biological Engineering Building. I'm sure that because we have reused so many existing buildings, there's a sense that why can't you just reuse another one? But uh, the functional requirements are quite specific and precise, and I can we can go into them in detail. But uh, it's just simply not practical. We've we've done it again and again on other projects, and it's just it just can't happen on on this one. Um, I would say that um, the the comments about this being a kind of um, a forebearer of the university um, continued encroachment into the neighborhood. There's really no basis for that. Um, if anything, the tradition of the university is one of is one of stewardship. So, um, and and as as I said when I showed the 30-year master plan, the campus plan, um, that that's not a deceitful uh, case. That's not a that's a very honest art, uh, document that says here's where we imagine where we could place new buildings. And there's nothing on that plan indicated over the 30 years to suggest that we would that we have any desires to to relocate any, any university activities into this particular neighborhood. Um, I would also just reiterate that um, uh, uh, evolution occurs. Again, things are not frozen in place. Buildings have moved on both sides of the street. There's nothing particularly regarding the historic preservation standards for a building uh, uh, being tied to its site. This is a street that has eating clubs on both sides of the street. So and there's, there's, it's not like it, this is Mount Vernon that we would be moving it a, a very, a very site specific with a particular vista um, to, uh, and moving it to um, another part of the site is, is really no, no damage. Right now, the, um, almost all of the clubs have uh, put trees in their backyards for privacy and exclusivity. And so the vistas that, that, that um, come with the name Prospect have been voluntarily um, uh, enclosed. And so um, it's, it really doesn't have those kinds of vistas. Right now, 91 Prospects looks out into one of our ugliest buildings on the history of the university, the computer <laughs> computing building, which, <laughs> which nobody here is defending, by the way. <laughs> what about that building? Um, so um, those, those are, those are, that's some of the points I would say uh, in, in, in summary. Madam Chair. And, All right. Madam Thank Chair. You. And Yes, yes. Um, I just want to address Mr. McCoy's comment about the three um, historic houses that are not- Wait, wait. Elizabeth? Yes. We're, you're fading out. We're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Okay, so I just want to address uh, yes. Mr. McCoy's comment about the three um, Queen Anne historic houses that are not in the so during my research of the report, I did find that Prospect um, Avenue report, which was in draft form, um, which actually was probably the, um, the report in which the former borough had recommended for it to be in a historic district. And with that, they had a map that shows it, and it was attached to my report, which actually delineates the properties within there. 
which actually includes it on the north side to go all the way to Murray Place. So um, if you read the recommended district within the master plan, it does talk about on both sides of Prospect and along portions of Washington, which would actually um, follow what that map says on there. And you know, um, when there's a district that's recommended in the master plan, there is a vetting required where it has to be approved by the planning board in addition to the council. So, you know, it would be great if they'd say, oh yeah, whatever you want to put on there. Um, that's not the case. And I think that um, those who actually sat on the borough or township knew that, that there's a process. So I believe that this is the map that was um, used for it because it was generated around the same time that the master plan was approved. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to point out to the um, like almost 80 people participating that um, the next step after this is the planning board meeting on June 17th. I think it's the 17th at uh, 7.30. So that's when um, there will be another public a hearing and a chance to comment. Um, we will obviously create a memo, but um, you know there are other steps to this process. Um, are there any further comments? Otherwise, I think we're done. Yes, Tom. Madam Chair, just to ask, uh, what is the role of the alternates in this process at the moment? I. Just your comments and you did a great job. So thank you. <laughs> okay. And uh, you're fine. All right. <laughs> just, one, just one final thing. I mean, I think so um, unless yeah, there for, yes. Yeah, I, do, I want to just add, I think it will be in our memo, but you know, I want to make sure that uh, the university gets kudos for the project itself, not particularly the historic aspect of it, but this, as many people have said, this is a very exciting project and uh, you know, keeps the university in the forefront of educational institutions in this country. So I'd just like to make sure that we uh, include that. Thank you. That's a, that's a great point. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for all the presentations, all the commentary, all the participation. We really appreciate it. And uh, perhaps we'll see many of you um, on the 17th. Thank you. Thank okay. you. So thank you. Thank you members. Thank you public. We appreciate thank you. it. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, David, for bringing my packet. Shona, you're quite welcome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I missed you. I, I was asleep. <laughs> I wanted a tour of your garden, but we'll do that another day. Oh, okay. I'll tell my gardener. <laughs> See you, Elric. See you, Elizabeth. Bye. Have a good day. Thank we ended early. You.